uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ray, and Ray's going to take us through uh, another uh, experience where he uh, things didn't go exactly as he had hoped or anticipated, and uh, kind of things that we can learn from that. So, Ray, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and thank you for having me be part of this discussion today, and certainly the whole course. And and so uh, we'll uh, talk about special problems and and when things go wrong. And my dad would tell me, um, who's not an orthopedic surgeon, by the way, he'd tell me to be, uh, learn from the mistakes of others because you you won't live long enough to make them all yourself, you know. And so um, sometimes I think it's nice to see other people's mistakes, and I'd like to share with everybody a mistake that I made probably about a decade ago that. That I, that I still think about. And some educational goals are we're gonna talk about the diagnosis of pelvic fractures, especially, um, or acetabular fractures, especially those that may or may not be associated with pelvic ring injuries. We'll talk about imaging details and, and being careful with your planning, uh, the hazards of combined injury, and, and really the consequences uh, for your patients when it comes to misdiagnoses. I just have a single case of a 38-year-old woman that I took care of just a little under a decade ago, and she was a driver in a motor vehicle collision that had come in uh, with a, with a uh, EHL and Tibant firing zero out of five, and she was hemodynamically stable and uh, was, uh, by laboratory accounts, a uh, victim of uh, polysubstance abuse. And, and this is her AP pelvic radiograph that you see on the right side. And some of the things that sort of stick out to me here, this is, oddly enough, this was somebody that had come into our institution. I was away. I think I was teaching an AO course. Um, and um, she had a fractured dislocation of her right hip. Um, I see a, a disruption of ilioischioiliopectineal lines. I see posterior wall and dislocation of the, uh, of the femoral acetabular joint. Her Jade views uh, would confirm that as well. Um, and so we'd arrived at uh, diagnosis of transverse posterior wall. I, I think that uh, it's worth mentioning that um, at the time she didn't really have a formal reduction attempt, uh, but had been you know, just kind of put in traction. And, and uh, these are a, a decade old uh, two di uh, two dimensional images that we uh, had achieved with our with our CT scan. Um, you can see that her head's a little bit better under her dome. She had had a myelogram just a couple days prior to this because of uh, chronic low back pain, and that's why her uh, CT looks a little unusual. You can still see the dislocation of the femoral head relative to the intact acetabular dome. And then her CT scan here, and I'll just try to run through this. You can see her residual myelogram die. She has a um, normal appearing sacroiliac joints, at least to me. You can see um, her comminution through her transverse as well as her posterior wall segments and some intraarticular uh, debris uh, that's present. And so she'd come in on a Friday and Monday morning, first thing I was able to take her to the operating room and um, we'd placed her prone. I like to uh, do a, a coker langenbeck exposure prone and put her on a flat top table. And uh, these are just some of the, the fluoros uh, images from uh, from uh, the operating room and one of the things that I noticed at first was I was having a real hard time reducing her transverse portion. I was having a real hard time lateralizing um, her femoral head and so I've had people tell me that you know lateral uh, traction is good and, and it's it's not my common practice but I thought that you know maybe this was the time to use some lateral traction and so instead of a shans pin I'd, I'd placed a hook that you can see over the greater trochanter and Still couldn't get it quite right and, and then used a uh, clamp that was placed uh, through the greater sciatic notch to clamp the transverse and, and uh, boy, it just still wasn't quite right. I think the femoral head was a little bit uh, better uh, lateralized, but uh, I wasn't terribly happy with my reduction. And so sometimes uh, I use a femoral distractor, one, one time uh, docked into the ilium and one time docked into the femur to restore length and maybe length was my problem and so I tried uh, getting length and you can see there's quite a bit of length if you really uh, look carefully you can see there's bending in my shans pin that's in my ilium and so I'm really 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 working hard uh, trying to get length back to help restore this uh, correctly and that didn't work and got a clamp on there and just really wasn't very happy with my acetabular reduction and then this is where I start sort of blaming the circumstance you know maybe if she had a better um, reduction or maybe if, if she didn't have her femoral head sitting um, on the back of uh, um, 
the acetabulum for three days, then it wouldn't be such a problem. Well, then I put a shans pin in the ischium and I'm trying to lateralize the ischium directly while putting a clamp and still um, cranking out um, uh, on our femoral distractor trying to achieve length. I'm just, I'm getting close, but I'm, I'm not terribly happy. And then I finally talked myself into a reduction. Talked myself into a reduction. I put in some instrumentation and this is what we have here. Here's our AP pelvic radiograph, and, and um, it, it appears to me at least the, the femoral head is underneath the dome. But then when you look at her obturator oblique view, you see that it isn't, it just isn't quite uh, a concentric uh, reduction. If I could bring the audience's attention here, you know, you can see this the acetabular dome is here, and then we get we get, I wouldn't call this a real gall sign. This isn't a gall sign, but rather uh, a lack of reduction of these columnar components. And certainly the overall uh, acetabular anatomy is not concentric uh, with our femoral head. Here's our AP pelvic uh, radiograph postoperatively. Iliac and obturator oblique views that you see. And then postoperative CT scan, which I think in a way uh, demonstrates to us um, what the bigger issue was. It's subtle, but her sacroiliac joint had widened somewhat. Um, and so uh, seeing that, um, we had had a talk with a patient about revising it and, and she just wasn't, um, she wasn't uh, terribly keen on the idea. And so uh, I think that might be my mistake in there. And just to sort of um, show you how important these subtleties of, of reduction may be, I, I've put these dates here. I've, I've put the date only because uh, just to, just to uh, show the audience how, how long of a problem this had occurred to the patient. This was, she was operated on February 8th, 2011. This is her post-op AP radiograph. She'd come in at about six weeks and she was having um, quite a bit of pain, but really wanted to walk. Uh, she was sort of on baseline narcotics anyhow, and so pain control was a real issue with her uh, at the time. And so she really wanted to walk, but we, we kind of held her off because I wasn't terribly satisfied with the union, especially of her transverse component of her acetabulum at the time. And this is March in 2011. Here she is about at her three month mark and she really, really wants to walk. And it was really kind of hard to see her, uh, to hold her back. And you can see now, uh, in addition to her acetabulum, we're having some incongruity of her symphysis pubis. She's not having pain there. Um, she's having pain really in her anterior hip. So she gets to walking and then, and then she comes back in August. And boy, this is about six months. And you can see the geometry of her femoral, or of her acetabulum just just kind of melting away right in front of us and, and um, just really wants pain medicine and doesn't want any further intervention at this point. And she comes back at, uh, in December of that year with, um, you know, you, could, you can see that she's got a limb length inequality. Uh, she's got uh, almost an acetabulum that seems to be dissolving uh, right before our very eyes. And then she kind of goes away for a while and these are post -oper These are films that she had brought back to us once she had come. Uh, come, she had gone to go see a, a joint replacement surgeon for second opinion, and you can see the flattening of the femoral head. And there's apparent union of her of her um, of her columnar components of her acetabular fracture here, but uh, very apparent limb length inequality. And then she comes back the next year, and she says, "Good news! I went and I got a total hip replacement." And then bad news was she got infected and she came to see one of our partners and she uh, noticed the date here. This is 2015. This is now four years after her index procedure. She'd gotten an infection. She'd seen one of my reconstruction partners who, who does a great job with revisions and, and uh, she'd gotten an antibiotic spacer, which had broken. Um, I think she had a revision antibiotic spacer. Um, she had gone on to have a revision arthroplasty with a, uh, a cup and a cage, which had gotten infected. And she had undergone another two-stage revision to a new uh, a revision prosthesis, uh, which had gotten infected. And she had had multiple stages. And here she is, the last, the last x-ray that I see, she sort of followed up with one of my senior partners and seems to be doing reasonably well and still hooked on narcotics. 
um, but they seem to have the infection uh, that's under control. And so I, I show you this date, this is 219, 2020. And to summarize what went wrong, um, you know, I think I, I didn't have a good diagnosis, both uh, preoperatively uh, and intraoperatively. Uh, some of the image details um, I missed, and I missed those really um, intraoperatively, which I'll show you on the, on the next slide. And, and I, um, these combined injuries, I think, have to be taken very seriously. And when you have a transverse fracture uh, pattern, I think you have to carefully scrutinize uh, both the symphysis pubis and uh, the sacroiliac joints, both the contralateral and ipsilateral sides. I think Dr. Krieger last week uh, showed us a very nice uh, case where he had a, a, a challenging uh, injury that was very, very similar to this, but I think he had a, a whole lot better clinical and, and hopefully radiograph, or a whole lot better radiographic and hopefully clinical result uh, than I did. Uh, the consequences can be great, um, you know, because I had a bad day in the operating room um, 10 years ago. This woman has had a, a bad decade with a hip, and, and you know, I think, a, I think um, a lot of that's on me. And so to summarize, if I were to, to see something like this next time, this, is, this to me is the key where I was focusing on the femoral acetabular joint. What I should have recognized intraoperatively was this widening of her sacroiliac joint that I did not see on her preoperative CT scan. And frankly, I, I just barely see on her postoperative CT scan. And so uh, if you ever see this in your practice, if this ever happens to you, I, I think you have to have the, um, I think you have to have the comfort in yourself and, and, and recognize the injury and stop and change your plan. Um, and, and at this point, I think if I were to do it again, I would deal with the sacroiliac joint. If I were you, I would deal with the sacroiliac joint in whichever way you deal with the sacroiliac joint to obtain proper reduction uh, of that femoral acetabular joint. And so the planning and the imaging details are important, not only in pre-op, but in intraoperative theater, uh, because sometimes your plan has to change based on the, the problems that may come up. Uh, again, combined injuries can be very serious, and, and this little uh, subtle incongruity of this sacroiliac joint, I think, made for a bad, bad outcome for this patient uh, in the line. And so these misdiagnoses have consequences, and most of the time, you're not the one that's living with them. It's your patient. And so, um, boy, that was really uplifting stuff. And so to summarize, <laughs> I, I think you have to be very careful. These are serious injuries, even in experienced hands. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's great, Ray, and, and I can tell by the difficulty you have presenting it that it, uh, these things take an emotional toll on you know, when, when you put your heart and soul into it and you have an outcome that's not what you want. It really does. It, it really is. Uh, it, it, it beats you down, so um, it's much better to have it work better. Do, do you have an algorithm in your own brain now? If you get in, uh, we all had that situation where we have a, a transverse fracture pattern that, uh, you know, we think we're just going to clamp and it's going to come together, and we do that, and and we are off a few millimeters and, and we just can't, you know, you, you change positions of your clamps and you fiddle with it and you pull on the head and you pull on, yeah. you do a lot of different things. And um, do, you, do you have in your own brain now sort of a, like, how, how, what do you think of next and where do you go if you're, if you've spent the last hour doing the same thing, putting clamps yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to do something different, you know, and, and it, so, so for me, you know, the funny thing of it is, is I've had this very same case a couple of times uh, after um, this operation. And one of the things that I like to do that's very powerful, it's, it's, it's time consuming and it's a little bit painstaking, but if I were to have this case to do over again, I would, I would stop. I would, I would close her coker langenbeck incision. I would put her supine uh, on a radiolucent table and I would put chance pins in her anterior, interior, or anterior inferior iliac spines. I would, I, would, I would use a femoral distractor or an intraoperative X-fix to close that SI joint, assuming that it's an incomplete SI joint like we have here. And then I would obtain screw fixation, um, stop, I'd put her back prone, uh, open her coker, laying back, back up, and then, and then fix it. 